Hello, welcome to the class, Marielos. Welcome to the class, Alex. And welcome to the class, Milton. I do really appreciate your punctuality. So thank you very much for being here. I know it's Friday and we're not used to being in class on a Friday. But anyways, thank you for being here. And remember, this is the last Friday that we're doing. After this one, I will think that we're back to normal from Monday to Thursday, which will be the best idea, actually, because I don't, I don't think. Or do you like to be in classes from Monday to Friday? Or you prefer from Monday to Thursday? What do you prefer, guys? I prefer from Monday to Thursday. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For it's... me, any problem. It does end up a problem, okay, Alex? Okay. Well. No problem with me, teacher. Okay, okay. But if I would like to choose, I will say from Monday to Thursday. Because <laughs> in my case, I work every single day. I work even during the weekends. So sometimes I like to have my Friday nights off, right? Just to have a little bit of a, I don't know, a time to relax. Okay, but thank you very much for being here. I do really appreciate it. As I said before, I know that being here on a Friday night requires a little bit more of a compromise because yes, sometimes we can be doing some other things on a Friday night. Oh, we're here. A good thing is that tomorrow, or do you work tomorrow, guys, or not? Yeah. You work tomorrow, Marielos? Yeah, I work tomorrow. Yeah. Till noon? Working too. Yeah, at noon. Okay, so you finish at noon. And then you have yeah. Sunday off. Yeah, okay. I have Sunday off. Where do you oh, work? Oh, I work in Unica, it's Universidad Católica. Del Salvador. Really? What's Santana. your job? What's your job there? Uh, I am an auditor. Marielos. Yeah. A few months ago, last year, I taught a class for like at one p.m. a one p.m. class, and I had students from Unicaes. Okay. Yeah. Hey, my. Hey. My co-worker Alex, it was in, it, it, it was in that. In that course with me? That course. I don't know with if with you, but it, I don't it remember. Was in. No, no, no. I don't remember in Alex, but I do remember that I had other students from there, and they were administrative um, as well. But I don't uh, remember the names because oh my god, I have he, so many groups he, of students. Okay. There I, were. I, I, I studied. I studied the, the basic level in in um, Unicaes when the program name was a uh, angel English for job. Uh, yeah. For the okay. Yes. Yeah. Programa Nacional de Inglés para el Trabajo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, also with, with the. Um, uh, in support program. Yeah. yeah, it was an in support program. That's true. It's in support program. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I had like four students, Marielos, four students yeah. from Unicaes. Yeah, you remember that uh, Patricia Quintana. It... Patricia. Patricia is yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Patricia is one. I don't remember the name of the other ones. But there were like four. Patricia, Annie. Annie, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They. Annie, Gloria, Gloria. Gloria, I think, I think. Annie, yes. Annie, remember. Anna, right? Anna, yes. Anna, Anna. exactly. Anna and you can, yeah, exactly, exactly. She's nice. Yeah. Um, if you can ask them, I was their teacher. I was their teacher at 1 p.m. We had a class at 1 p.m. From 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if they remember me, but I do remember that I was teaching a class for like, like it was all always English corporativo, but I had people from Unicaes. That's why when you say Unicaes from Santana, it was like, I had a student from there. It was last year. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, you know, the world is 
small en El Salvador is smaller. Yeah. <laughs> small. <laughs> El Salvador is really small. <laughs> okay. Really small. Perfect. So thank you for being here as well, Miguel and Boris. As I was saying uh, before, it's I know it's an effort to be here on a Friday night, but I do really appreciate it. And this is our last Friday night doing this. Okay. So let's hope it's just this module like this. Okay. Uh, in the last class, we were talking a little bit about uh, clauses, like conditional clauses, and how to use the, for example, the commas. And we have, we have dependent and non-dependent clauses or defining or non-defining relative clauses. So I'm gonna explain that a little bit better today, but actually that's one of the topics that I liked the most when I was in college, because that's one, one of the only topics that I could understood, <laughs> I could understand. And um, we're gonna have discuss that, that today. But before we go and discuss that, we're gonna do the pronunciation practice as we always do, okay? And on Monday, so I will let you practice today, then you can practice on your own Saturday and Sunday. And we are going to, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we're going to do a speed test on Monday. So not only saying like, very bad, a bit of, butter, but the speed, like the time you take to say the tongue twister, okay? Because remember, in Spanish, it's always the same. It's not like I say, Pablito, clavón, clavito. It's how fast I say it, right? So the same thing is that's going to happen with the tongue twister that we had yesterday. And we're going to practice a little bit of it today. Actually, Marielos, if you ask your Co-workers, I taught them the tongue twisters. They they should know some of the tongue twisters because I taught them that. I always start from basic with that. <laughs> okay, this. Okay, you were practicing this, just something to remember because yesterday I noticed that we weren't remembering that. But if it has an U, it's butter, butter, butter butter and if it has a letter i is bitter there is only one bitter right then we have better better that's better if it has one e two e's it's better okay better then this pronunciation right here, we're gonna write, like, put a heart on it. Okay, this pronunciation right here, it's like you had two A's, but it's not but because that's like Batman, right? It's not, it's but, but like a long A, but. You don't say bout because I heard a lot of people saying bout yesterday. It's not bout, it's but. Okay. And always remember that two T's together, they're going to sound like an like an R. Okay. So Betty. It's not Betty. It's Betty. Well, actually, maybe in England they can say Betty or something like that. But in the most used English, that is the English from the United States, is Betty, okay? So Betty, but a bit of, and I, and, I, and I put these three words together, a bit of butter, but the butter, Betty, but was bitter. So Betty, but a better butter, and it was better than the butter Betty bought before, okay? I'm going a little bit faster. Betty bought a bit of butter, but the butter Betty bought was bitter. So Betty bought a better butter and it was better than the butter Betty bought before. Betty bought a bit of butter, but the butter Betty bought was bitter. So Betty bought a better butter, 
and it was better than the butter, but it was before, right? That's how you're going to say it. I'm gonna give you some time to practice in this moment. Remember, in English, pronunciation, you can achieve it only by practicing. There's not something magical that is going to happen to you. It's not like that. It's practice. It takes a lot of practice, okay? So if you want to have a good pronunciation, you have to do things like this, the tongue twisters. If you have to do learning songs, you have to practice speaking with other people. So right now I'm gonna give you the time to practice because this is your opportunity to practice and not my opportunity to practice, okay? This is you, you need to do these things. Let me see. <clears throat> Let's go there. Please join the breakout rooms.
uh, is bail. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a signal that exercise is good. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 The, the mouth is more, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, movimiento, movement of the movement. tongue. Yeah. Uh, movement of the tongue is more uh, quickly. Agile. Ah, quickly. Yeah, quickly. Yeah. Is okay. Quickly. Another, okay. another one. Very bad okay, a bit me. of butter. No, oh. no. Okay. But okay. the very bad. Very bad a bit of butter, but the butter very bad was bitter. So very bad a bit of butter, and it was better than the butter. Butter. Okay. okay. Very bad a bit of butter, but the butter very bad was bitter. So very bad a uh, bitter butter, and it was better than the butter very bad. Before. Okay, Miguel, I feel like you're saying a little D when you say the double T. It's like an R. Bitter, better, butter. Bitter. Bitter. Better. 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 Butter. Butter. Exactly. Okay. Okay.
Hello. So you didn't want to come to the main session. So I'm guessing I'm, I'm going to have some brave people to say the tongue we start in this moment. So who wants to participate? Who's going to be the brave one? Boris, okay. excellent. Um, well, then the Marielos, okay. Boris and yeah. Marielos, okay. Okay. Very bad, a bit of butter, but the butter very bad was bitter. So very bad, a better butter, and it was better than the butter very bad before. Wow, good job. That was perfect. Thank you, Boris. Thank wow, you. excellent. That was really good. Really, really good. Okay, Marielos, your turn. Oh, excuse me, teacher. I don't have that. The... You don't the have thing. the tongue twister? Oh, you want me to share it with you? Uh, okay, I can no, share. I, I can I, share. Okay. 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 Very bad, a bit of butter, but the butter very bad was bitter. So very bad, a bit of butter, and it was better than the butter very bad before. Wow. Wow, Mariela's good oh. job. Perfect. Excellent. Thank good you. Wow, I, was, I was telling to Boris that when you were practicing, we when we were, we were practicing, we feel uh, the mouth is uh, uh, pain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you felt the pain in the in, in your yeah. muscles of your mouth. Yeah, it was good exercise. Yeah. You see, you see, some people don't believe it and they say, hey, I don't know why the teacher is doing the dog research. I don't get it and stuff like that. But when you do it, like when you actually do it, you feel it and you feel yeah. it here, right? And then it hurts. It's like when you go to the gym and they say, no pain, no gain, right? If it doesn't hurt, it's not working. So it's the same. But here's the question. Do you feel like you're improving your pronunciation with these tongue twisters? Yeah. Yes? I think right? it, yeah. yeah. It's training. You are training your pronunciation. Perfect. And remember, this is just for everybody else. When you are learning English, you are against yourself. What I'm trying to say with this is, it doesn't matter if a person you think they are doing better than you, because this is something for you, okay? I'm not here like competing against Marielos or against Milton, this is against myself. So if I speak a better English than I spoke yesterday, I'm improving, okay? That, that's the stuff. If I say it slow, but I say the words like they are supposed to be, then I'm improving. If I say it fast, I'm improving. If I'm saying a word that I used to say before differently and now I say it better, I'm improving, okay? It's, it's different for everybody. Everybody has a different learning process. So it's you, it's you, okay? I'm trying to say with this because I remember I had a classmate when I was in college. She was really good. She was really, really good at English. Perfect. She, since she was eight years old, she was studying English by herself and by her own. And she was really good when we got to college and I didn't know any English when I got to college. So obviously she was the best one in the class. And I was like, eh, I was getting there. I was the type of student that was like, okay, if I have a good grade and I pass the subject, it's okay, I don't care. But then I got the chance to improve my English. She was really good since we, we started. But I, but I got better with my time, okay? Now, if I can speak with her, or English is very similar. Not because we were in a competence, because that I improved my English when I had to improve my English, and she had the opportunity to start very young. So it's different that what I'm trying to say with this is very different for everybody. If you want to say the tongue twister, you're saying very bad, a bit of 
pattern, it's okay because that's your process, okay? After saying this, that someone else wants to participate. Now, we're gonna, you're gonna leave it for Monday because on Monday we're gonna do it again. Yeah? Okay, okay, good, perfect. <laughs> Now, we're going to go with the video that I told you about um, <clears throat> section four, the relative and non-relative clauses. Let me show you that video. Defining, I mean, it's in defining and not defining clauses. Think about the people involved. In I know we have studied relative clauses before. But this time we'll learn a little bit more. Stay and find out the difference between defining and non-defining relative clauses. Defining and non-defining relative clauses. Defining relative clauses are used to identify people. A dialect coach is a language specialist. She works with actors on their accents. A dialect coach is a language specialist who works with actors on their accents. A dialect coach is a language specialist that works with actors on their accents. Non-defining relative clauses give further information about people. A location scout finds places to shoot scenes. He travels all over the world. A location scout who finds places to shoot scenes travels all over the world. As we mentioned on the intro video, we have two types of relative clauses. Defining and non-defining relative clauses. Let's look at the difference between them. Number one, defining relative clauses. The information in the clause is necessary. It shows us which person is being described or talked about. For example, the actor who starred in that movie is very talented. Number two, non-defining relative clauses. The information isn't necessary. It is extra information that is added to the sentence. For example, Tom Cruise, who starred in that movie, is very talented. I want to point out that commas are used before and after a non-defining relative clause. Okay, so basically what she's saying is this, defining and non-defining relative clauses. Defining clauses are those clauses that without them, the sentence doesn't have a meaning, a full meaning. And non-defining clauses are those clauses that add extra information to the sentence, but they are not necessary in the sentence, okay? That's what it is. When I was studying, I like to compare the non-defining relative clauses with the parentheses in, in Spanish. For example, if I say the teacher Diana, who was in English Corporativo, taught me about non-defining relative clauses. Like, who works at English Corporativo is extra information. And I put it in a parenthesis in, in, in Spanish, right? It's extra information. But in English, it's not parenthesis. In English, will be commas. So, for example, <clears throat> you say that Tom, you saw the Tom Cruise one, right? Like here. The doctor who works in the hospital Okay, here. Oops, sorry. Now, here, this is a non-defining relative clause. You can see, as she said, that they are open with a comma and they are closed with a comma. Now, here I say, 
the doctor, oh, sorry, who works in the hospital gave me some medicine. Actually, if I erase this, now wait a second. Uh, here. So you see, the doctor gave me some medicines. It still has the same meaning, but with this, I add extra information. Yeah? So it's not important to the sentence, but it gives extra information. This is a non defining relative clause. But now let's look, I want to see the example that she gives about defining ones. Let's go back here. Example, okay. the, actor the actor who started in that movie is very talented. The actor who started in that movie is very talented. The actor who started in that movie is very talented. Okay. The person who the car is rich. The person who bought the car is rich. In this case, this is a defining relative class because if I erase this part right here, the person is rich, who? What person? I don't know who's the person, okay? So because I don't know who's the person, I do need the defining relative clause to define it. But now let's do the same example with a non-defining relative clause. Now we know who's the person. In that case, we only know that that person bought a car. That's why the, the relative clause is important. But now we know the name of that rich person is Marcos. Okay, I know Marcos who bought the car is rich. You see? Now, in this case, this clause is not necessary because I know who is the person. The person is Marcos. But in this case, I don't know the name of the person. So how can I describe that? Oh, it's the person who bought the car. And without it, the sentence doesn't have a meaning. But this one right here, it does have a meaning. Marcos is rich. I don't need to say that Marcos bought the car. I don't need to say it. But if I want to add extra information, yes, Marcos who bought the car is rich. Is it understandable? Only Maria Luz is saying yes. More example, okay. teacher. Another example, do you want another example? Okay, let me see. <clears throat> the student that came late Problematic. Okay, the student that came late is problematic. Now, this is defining relative clause, right? Because if I erase this part right here, the student is problematic. What student? Who is the student? I don't know. So I need that extra information. That's why I have the defining relative clauses. The student that came late, that came, came late is problematic. Now let's look at another example. The same example, but in this case, I know the name of the student. So maybe the name of the student is Ronnie. Ronnie, who came late. is 
a problematic student. Now, this clause right here with the commas is not necessary because I know who is the person, right? Who is the person? It's Ronnie. Ronnie is the student. But if I erase this right here, Ronnie is a problematic student. Does it have a meaning in this sentence by itself? Can you understand the sentence there? Yes or not? Yes, right? But adding this yes. non-defining relative clause is just giving us extra information. Ronnie is a problematic student and he also came late today. So I'm giving extra information to that. Now, remember again, defining clauses, they need that extra information. Non-defining relative clauses, this information is just extra. And the sentence without that non-defining relative clause will always have sense. It will always make sense because it's perfectly, this is only extra information. Is it clearer now? Yes, teacher. Yes, teacher, it's clear, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. It's clear, teacher. Okay. Guys, don't leave me alone. Sometimes I feel like I'm speaking to myself <laughs> because you don't answer and I'm like, <laughs> that's sad. What? Don't leave me alone because sometimes I'm speaking and you're not, not answering and I feel like I'm alone. So don't leave me alone. No. The teacher, it's a rule and about the extra information. You put commas in. Yeah. Okay. It's like, that's what I was telling you. It's like parentheses. Okay. It's just to say that that's extra information. It's not relevant to the, the, the sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay, Okay. let's watch the first video of section five. I'm gonna play the video for you. This is gonna be, take, uh, take notes if you can, okay? Because then we're gonna discuss this video. You're about to watch the very last video of this course. We hope you enjoy them. We suggest for you to keep on watching and practicing your language. Hi, I'm Kai Nagata. I'm a television journalist based here in Montreal, Canada, and I'm also a lifelong cyclist. Right now, cycling is getting more and more popular in Montreal, with 10% of all commuters getting to work by bike, like me, and city officials want that number to increase. More bicycles means more bicycle traffic, and that means sharing the road. There's lots of opinions about how pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers should act and interact in the city. Let's find out what people think. Is there anything Montreal could do to improve things for cyclists? Yeah, well, I think the city should try to expand the system of cycle paths. One thing I learned this morning is that one shouldn't drive against traffic <laughs> because that's a problem. Sometimes there are corners uh, where drivers just cannot see you coming and so you should really try to avoid driving against the traffic if possible. What advice do you have for cyclists in the city? Cyclists should have their own bike lane and drive towards the oncoming traffic because they will be able to better see what the other parked cars are doing, whether they're driving or parked, the cyclists will have more control. What do you think drivers ought to do to help keep cyclists safe? Drivers should always check their rearview mirrors before opening their doors so that they don't hit a bicycle that's coming up behind them. Do you spend more time driving or riding a bike? Driving. What do you think Montreal could do to encourage cycling as an option for people? Uh, maybe education, maybe some restriction to driving downtown. So maybe making it harder for drivers. Right, right. that's the nature, the human nature. What advice would you give people who are cycling with children? There should be a law that says all children starting from age six should be educated on the rules of bicycling. What do you think of the idea of kids wearing bike helmets? I think they should 
but a lot of them won't. What do you think the city could do to make cyclists even safer in Montreal? Um, I think it, it would be best if bicycles and buses were not on the same street. Why do you think that? Because they're not compatible. The bus is very large and we're uh, very small and not protected, but we drive approximately the same speed or on the same path. What do you think cyclists should do to help keep themselves safe in traffic? Be more aware of both automobiles and pedestrians. I think uh, there are ways in which sometimes we cut corners in terms of moving through traffic, um, particularly moving traffic, I think cyclists need to be aware. What do you think when you see cyclists riding around with headphones in? I don't think it's the best idea. Uh, you have to be alert. Um, you don't often need your ears when you're cycling, but every once in a while you hear something that indicate something that you didn't see and I, for safety reasons that I think you know I'd like to listen I'd like to bike and listen to music too but if you're gonna do that I think you should do that in a park what advice do you have for cyclists in the city people should never wear Walkmans or iPods or whatever uh, while they cycle because a lot of cycle safety has to do with listening what advice would you give people who are cycling with children I think cycling on the sidewalk is fine uh, with kids. Uh, I think most pedestrians are at ease with it. Uh, you know, look here, look at how wide this sidewalk is. If you have young children who are just learning to cycle, I don't see anything wrong with cycling on the sidewalk along here. What's your impression of Montreal as a city for cycling? Cyclists should take a bigger piece of the city and play a bigger role in the city. And I think that uh, Drivers and even pedestrians should relax a bit about cyclists. Cyclists are good for cities. Wherever bikes and cars share the road, people are going to have opinions about how they ought to interact. Montreal is no exception, and we may not have solved all the problems yet, but we're working on it. I'm Kai Nagata reporting from Montreal, Quebec, Canada. So, did you get everything that was said on the video? Nope. You want to watch it one more time? Yeah? Okay. Yes, teacher. Yes, one more time, please. You're about to watch the very last video of this course. We hope you enjoy them. We suggest for you to keep on watching and practicing your language. Hi, I'm Kai Nagata. I'm a television journalist based here in Montreal, Canada, and I'm also a lifelong cyclist. Right now, cycling is getting more and more popular in Montreal, with 10% of all commuters getting to work by bike, like me, and city officials want that number to increase. More bicycles means more bicycle traffic, and that means sharing the road. There's lots of opinions about how pedestrians, cyclists, and drivers should act and interact in the city. Let's find out what people think. Is there anything Montreal could do to improve things for cyclists? Yeah, well, I think the city should try to expand the system of cycle paths. One thing I learned this morning is that one shouldn't drive against traffic <laughs> because that's a problem. Sometimes there are corners uh, where drivers just cannot see you coming and so you should really try to avoid driving against the traffic if possible. What advice do you have for cyclists in the city? Cyclists should have their own bike lane and drive towards the oncoming traffic because they will be able to better see what the other parked cars are doing, whether they're driving or parked, the cyclists will have more control. What do you think drivers ought to do to help keep cyclists safe? Drivers should always check their rearview mirrors before opening their doors so that they don't hit a bicycle that's coming up behind them. Do you spend more time driving or riding a bike? 
driving. What do you think Montreal could do to encourage cycling as an option for people? Uh, maybe education, maybe some restriction to driving downtown. So maybe making it harder for drivers. Right, right. that's the nature, the human nature. What advice would you give people who are cycling with children? There should be a law that says all children starting from age six should be educated on the rules of bicycling. What do you think of the idea of kids wearing bike helmets? I think they should, but a lot of them won't. What do you think the city could do to make cyclists even safer in Montreal? Um, I think it, it would be best if bicycles and buses were not on the same street. Why do you think that? Because they're not compatible. The bus is very large and we're uh, very small and not protected, but we drive approximately the same speed or on the same path. What do you think cyclists should do to help keep themselves safe in traffic? Be more aware of both automobiles and pedestrians. I think uh, there are ways in which sometimes we cut corners in terms of moving through traffic, um, particularly moving traffic. I think cyclists need to be aware. What do you think when you see cyclists riding around with headphones in? I don't think it's the best idea. Uh, you have to be alert. Um, you don't often need your ears when you're cycling, but every once in a while you hear something that indicate something that you didn't see and I, for safety reasons that I think you know I'd like to listen I'd like to bike and listen to music too but if you're gonna do that I think you should do that in a park what advice do you have for cyclists in the city people should never wear Walkmans or iPods or whatever uh, while they cycle because a lot of cycle safety has to do with listening what advice would you give people who are cycling with children I think cycling on the sidewalk is fine uh, with kids. Uh, I think most pedestrians are at ease with it. Uh, you know, look here, look at how wide this sidewalk is. If you have young children who are just learning to cycle, I don't see anything wrong with cycling on the sidewalk along here. What's your impression of Montreal as a city for cycling? Cyclists should take a bigger piece of the city and play a bigger role in the city. And I think that uh, Drivers and even pedestrians should relax a bit about cyclists. Cyclists are good for cities. We're okay. Could you, like, just tell me, because it's time already, someone here, what did you understand from the video? Uh, let's see, let's let's ask the bodies. Bodies, what did you understand from the video? Well, the bike is the other transportation uh, that we need because the bike uh, helps uh, uh, less pollution. Mm -hmm. And uh, cities like uh, Quebec, Oh, Montreal, sorry, Montreal uh, is used more and more people uh, bike. Okay. I understand that. Okay. Thank you, Boris. Thank you very much. Okay. Alex Hako, you want to participate? No? Hello? Can you hear me, guys? So far. And bicycles, but for in 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 all people, think, piensa, ¿cómo se dice piensa? Think. Think. All people think uh, is the better solution for reduce the pollu pollution. Mm -hmm. Um. And, and also for the, uh, also the uh, edger, uh, 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 exercising? Uh, exercise. Exercise, yes. Okay. This, this, this is. 
Okay, thank you very much. Well, we're gonna talk a little bit more about it in on Monday. And remember, you have to practice the tongue twister on Monday, like to say it on Monday with speed limit. And I will see you guys on Monday again. Okay, have a good weekend. Take care. Work on the platform because we need to complete all uh, section four, right? And we need to start. We need to start with section five already. Okay. So have a good weekend. Take care, and I will see you guys on Monday. Okay. Bye. 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 Have a good night and Happy weekend. weekend. Okay. Good weekend. Bye bye.